because I think I can do a better job than him. <laughs> Everybody's supposed to laugh on that one. That was it. <laughs> Uh, he, he, he wanted me to step in here tonight if you would help me out. Let's go to 257. 257. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. That's the truth. Amen. 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 Oh, my God. 
all now. Don't we be hanging up here. Help me, brother out. <laughs> He's worthy of our praise. Amen. 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 Hallelujah means praise ye Jehovah. Amen. And if you didn't come that if you didn't come tonight for that, Amen. what are you doing here? Amen. Amen. What are we singing for? We ain't got voices. <laughs> We're singing to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So don't don't wimp out just because it says the word hallelujah. Let her rip. Amen. Amen. All right, number two. praying for them. Uh, so we want to financially support these guys, but more important than that, we want to keep them on our heart and be in really fellowship with them. Uh, that's what happens when you enter into their ministry there. You, you take that part there, that's your duty to not only give towards that cause, but also to pray for that family and that work. And uh, amen, those that uh, stay by the stuff will part a lock. And uh, I want to have a part in what those missionaries are doing over there for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way you, you really get involved in missions. You give and you groan. You pray for these men and their families. Uh, they certainly need it. All right, let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing on the offering then. Brother Judd, would you pray for us? Father God, we thank you, God. For another night, Father, we can come and hear something, God. Help us to stop this week, God, to be able to be involved in spirit. God, not to walk in our place. God, help us not to God. He is good to trust you. Father God, with our kids and jobs, God. Father God, what you show us in the Word, God, it's just good to trust you. I thank you, God, for the right way for us to understand, God, through your Word, that we can trust you. In everything, God, we do, thank you. And God, I pray you get the men, this church wisdom, God, that Whatever you use this money for, God, whatever you'd want it to use for, Father, that they would use it for your glory. God, 
do help us, God, to support missionaries, God, not only support it, God, but strengthen that desire inside of us. God, to set aside personal time. Father God, that God, to pray. God, because you asked, you told us uh, to pray. Yes. To pray. God, to pray to you for them and their families. God, we pray for them. God, we ask you that God keep them safe, God. The men, their wives, God, their kids. God, build a hedge about all of them. The ones we support, God, the ones that are serving you in the field, God, that we don't even know about. God, take care of them. God, thank you for letting us be a part of that. And help us, God, and strengthen that desire to be more of a part of that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
us to Luke chapter 1 tonight. <clears throat> Get Luke chapter 1 and also 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Have that mark. We'll get to that eventually. But we'll be in Luke chapter 1 here first. And I want to just talk about, about our role during what, what they, they refer, refer to as the, uh, the Christmas season. season. Our role as believers, talking about emphasizing really how we are children of the day. This is a Christmas week, always an exciting time of year. A lot of uh, different things are going on, activities, gift giving. Uh, it all adds to the excitement. But again, the message behind the occasion is to be in Christ. And uh, what I'd just like to emphasize tonight is that we be more jealous about that as the people of God, amen, and not... Just get caught up with blending in because there is an ecumenical movement that takes place during this time of year. And, uh, and again, uh, this is to be about Him. It's not, it's not a time of year where it's just about the gracious, graciousness of the people. And it's not about mankind or toys for the children. And I hate to point all this out because I realize I, I sound like a Grinch to some people. But uh, there is a message of humanism. Uh, and that is the spirit of Antichrist in this day and time, we've got to realize that that's the strong opposition we're facing in American culture today. And uh, it overlays all that. If you're not careful, it will get highly broadcasted this time of year and overshadow what we're all about. And, uh, and Satan's a deceiver, and he, of course, is a very clever in how he seeks to block the glory of God and keep people's attention off of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we got to be wise about that. Uh, charities are fine this time of year, uh, but amen, the Bible says that everything that's done ought to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, and it ought to be done in the name of Christ. Children's joys and laughter, uh, all that's a good thing, but uh, there is no joy as lasting as that of the Lord Jesus, and, and children need to know about the Lord. All, all the people that you work with, all our relatives that we have, all our neighbors, they need to know about Jesus and more, uh, amen, than just the manner in which He came into the world, emphasizing His birth, but also the purpose for His coming. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's the truth about men. And uh, we might uh, have that just swept under the rug if we're not careful. Uh, both poverty and riches get emphasized this time of year. And, uh, and, and they're, you know, more than that, people are lost. And we forget that. As blessed as someone's situation can be while they're living with all the things God's given them, uh, and as, as desperate as another person's situation may be, as far as their poverty, after this life is over, uh, both the rich and the poor are going to be somewhere forever. And uh, we need to be chiefly concerned about that. Christ taught, of course, that we are to care for the poor. Uh, we're to give to the poor, certainly uh, there are those of us that have enough to do that. I believe we can all afford to give something. And we all ought to be grateful for what God has given us. But Christ's coming was not just so that those who have riches would appreciate uh, what they have and pity the poor. Amen. He didn't just come so that the rich would give to the poor and the poor would be pitied. But the need of all men, rich and poor, is that they're lost to God. They are separated from God. They're dying in their sins without Christ and therefore without hope, and, and without God. And it was Jesus that said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent not a Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, or might, be, might have everlasting life. And He goes on to say this, He says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And listen, folks, he said, This is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they're wrought in God. Now Christ, what he's pointing out in that passage that, that we're familiar with, is the reaction that men have to the light. And of course, specifically, his light. Uh, he notes that the world's in darkness, and by his nature, he's light. 
And, and if someone in their heart is afflicted by darkness and they desire the light, then when the light comes, they'll go to the light. But on the other hand, for those that love darkness, then when they are confronted with the subject of the Lord Jesus Christ and the subject of the light of God, then what takes place is they begin to be repulsed by it. And they turn away from it. And the Lord lets us know that we can tell what direction a person's heart is facing by their reaction to the subject of Jesus, by their reaction to light. If they, if they love light, then they'll go to the light. If they love darkness, they'll stay away from the light. And there may be other things they like to talk about. They may like to blame hypocrites in the church or someone hurt their feelings. But according to Christ, it's a reaction to light. And they're either for it or they're against it. And when Jesus cometh into the world, the Bible tells us, He said, I come to do thy will, O God. And Jesus, by going to the cross and by giving His blood and atonement for the sins of our race, dying in our place, facing our judgment, He fulfilled the will of God. Now He's ascended up to the Father. He's seated at the Father's right hand. So this is He who is light. He entered into the heavens. Now where we're at, it's nighttime. It's a nighttime dispensation. This is a dark world. And it's as dark as it's ever been. And listen, with the further we go, the deeper we go into the night, so much so that the Apostle Paul says in Romans 13, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And over in the book of Psalms, the Bible speaks there of day unto day uttering speech. And that passage in Psalms 19 is talking about how the heavens declare the glory of God. And without getting too much into that tonight, let's just say this for time's sake, the sun is a type. It's a physical, visible picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and when he came the first time, it was day. And that's exactly what he referred to in John chapter 9 verse 4 when he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. He said, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And, and get this, when Jesus comes again, and, and he is coming again. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, the Son of righteousness appear, arise with healing in his wings. And back there in Psalms 19, there is it speaking of the heavens declaring the glory of God. He's showing that Son there as a strong man running a race, as a bridegroom. He's speaking of that thing and he's talking about day unto day. There's one day and then there's a second day. Christ was here, that's one day. And then he's coming again, that's a, that's a brand new day. And ironically, it was night before Jesus came, and it's not time now while he's in heaven, but when he comes back to earth, it's going to be the day of the Lord. And it's going to be a brand new day. Now, here in Luke chapter 1 where I've got you, we're going to read some things that were said by John the Baptist's father. And uh, John the Baptist was a great preacher. Matter of fact, he's one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. And, uh, and his daddy, hey amen, he, he's a pretty good preacher too. And here in Luke chapter 1, down there at verse 67, notice what it says. Luke chapter 1, verse 67, it says, And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Verse 69. And hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and remember uh, his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, speaking about his son, thou, child, John the Baptist, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. Now there's a statement to the deity of Christ right there. Thou shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord. Now again, when the Lord refers to Jesus as the Lord, he's the Lord. And here he's called the prophet of the highest, he said, Thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto His people by the remission of their sins 
through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way into the way of peace. Now listen, the night that Jesus came into the world there, He entered into the world, the angels, they came, Gabriel came with a message, and it was not a message of judgment. Listen, when Gabriel began to preach, he said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And then he says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And two things there involving the message that Gabriel preached uh, that night. There's the character of the message, and there's the content of the message. When we, we talk about the character of the message, we're talking about the nature of it. And he describes it himself as good tidings and great joy to all people. That is, Christ, though he is the seed of Abraham, and he's the son of David, he's also the seed of the woman. In Genesis 3.15, and he's promised to break the power of sin, and he's promised to bruise the head of the serpent. The character of the message that night was good tidings and great joy. That was the character of the message Gabriel preached. And then the content of the message was to identify the one that was born as Savior, as Christ, and as the Lord. That's the content of the message. Again, we preach... Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that is why He was named Jesus in the first place. That The Bible says, For He shall save His people from their sins. And the name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. And so He's the Savior, He's the Christ, and He's the Lord. The King of the Jews, the heir to the throne of David, anointed by the Spirit of God to be God's prophet, priest, and king, He's the Christ, He's the Lord and He's the Savior. And keep in mind that before He was ever born, this is the one who stepped out of nowhere and stood on nothing and spoke everything into existence. The Bible says all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And at night time, the light of the world was born. He entered into the human race at night time. The Bible says in John, in Him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Speaking of John the Baptist. And it says, The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave Him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And He says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, Amen. That's the Lord Jesus. And there's some things that John the Baptist bore witness to him about. And, and listen, John the Baptist's uh, father bore witness to him and gave him a title. And he called him, and we read it there in Luke chapter 1, the day spring. The day spring. And this time of year, I like to point that out. It was night when he came. And when he came, John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, filled with the Holy Ghost, says, the day spring is here. And he pointed to the birth of Jesus Christ and the world was in the dark. Just like it is today, the world was in the dark. It was night. Over there in Job chapter 9, Job of course is a, under the judgment of God. He says, that which I greatly feared has come upon me. And I think there's any number of things that if you wanted to see them out, say he could have been talking about this, that, and that. I, I believe that he enjoyed the favor of God and he knew it. I believe he, he understood the grace of God in his life. I believe he understood the pleasure of God in his life. God had been good to him and it didn't go without Job noticing it. And Job had that governing principle of the fear of God in his life. And he understood God had been good to him. And when he talked about that which he greatly feared, I believe, friend, personally, I believe it was God putting him under his judgment. I mean, he lived a while. He had seen some other people go through some things. 
And now he was going through those things. And he says, that which I greatly feared has come upon me. And what he wanted was somebody that could bring him and God to the table. Somebody that could reconcile them. Somebody that could solve the problem between them. He wanted a middleman. The New Testament said he wanted a mediator. That's the title. But what Job calls him, he says, He's not a man as I am that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that he might lay his hand upon us both. What he was looking for was a daysman. So think about it, friends. What Job desired, we've got. We've got the middleman. We've got the mediator. We've got the daysman, the one that was called by Zechariah, the day spring, is our daysman. He's our middleman. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, listen, it's nighttime. Even while it's night, we have a daysman. Amen. Betwixt us and the Father and his life, up, his life up there affects our life down here. His light up there affects our light down here. Now I had you to mark 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I want you to turn there. And again, I know you're familiar with this passage. You're familiar with many things that I'll be saying tonight. But again, I'm not here to tell you something new all the time. Amen. Sometimes we just need to be stirred up about some things we already know. And, and that's a whole lot of what preaching is. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4, I want you to think about this. In light of the season and all the talk about the season and all the festivities and all that stuff, verse 4 says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all the children of light and the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. See, we've got to be very careful. The devil doesn't come as the devil. Amen. He doesn't show up and say, hey, I'm about to do something here. I'm the devil. That's not the way he works. He uses the sentiment of men. And he works. Usually you've seen the movies with the, with the nice, pleasant music in the background. Just caressing people and getting them to think a certain way and feel a certain way. And listen, Hollywood is skilled at that. Hollywood is skilled at taking a, a, a character and uh, making you dislike him. And then before that thing's over, making you understand him. And that's what their message is. That's what they want you to understand. They just cause you to switch loyalties because they found out they can manipulate people that way. They can do it with music. They can do it with their storytelling and their, and their observation points there, the perspective they offer there. And the Bible tells us to be sober, to be awake. And see, I'm saying that there's a lot of stuff that goes on this time of year that will lull you to sleep. And you'll be caught up in everything that's going around, but you won't be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here. So he says in verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. And with that in mind, the Apostle Peter points to that direction of Christ's future coming there, and he says in 2 Peter 1.19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, where until you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, it goes like this. Christ at His first coming at His birth, He's the day spring. According to Zechariah right now, He mediates between us and the Father. He's the day's man. He's reconciled us. And when He returns again to receive us up on high, He's the day star. And in speaking about our association with Jesus in the Scripture, we are identified, the church of the Lord Jesus, as children of the day. Children of the day. We're of the day. We are the people of Jesus we're called out by His name. We were saved by calling upon His name. Amen. Listen, we assemble even tonight in His name. And our objective is to further His name to the uttermost part of the earth. And to us, there's no name like His name. And to God the Father, there's no name like His name. His name's above every other name. And it's at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now there are those who are wrapped up in the spirit of the day. And as I said earlier, that's humanism. 
That's where the objection is coming. That's where the opposition is coming from. It is the spirit of Antichrist there. And they are about men. That's what they're about. Men. People. The glory of man. They believe all men are good. They believe men can solve the world's problems. Therefore, they are by nature and by philosophy, they are going to despise the message about how the Word became a man, how He was born into the world without a human father, lest the taint of our defiled nature pass upon Him. They don't want to hear about how dark the world is, and they don't want to hear about especially why it's so dark, because they'll find out, friend, that, the, that man is not the solution to the world's problems. Man is the reason for the world's problems. And the problem with man is sin. And when they make their objections, I'm just telling you, it's going to get more and more prevalent there. They're going to make it sound as if it's a, philosoph a philosophical objection. They're going to try to make it sound like it, it, they're objecting on the basis of others' freedoms of all things. But Jesus told us long before they objected what the real problem was. He says this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest with the rod in God. And friend, what I'm reminding us of tonight, if you needed to be reminded, if not, then I'm just trying to strengthen your hands towards this truth, is we are children of the day. We don't fit in in this world. And that's the way it's supposed to be. This world's not our home. He's the light. In Him is no darkness at all. We're children of the day. Amen. We, 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 we came to Him. We know God through Him. And as Christ comes into the world at birth, again, He's called the day spring. As Christ mediates between us and the Father, uh, He's the day's man. And when Jesus comes again to meet, and we're going to meet Him in the air, He's the day star. That day star there is the brightest star in the night there right towards the end of the night, right before dawn. And, and, and before the second coming, there's the appearance of Christ. That's our blessed hope. We're looking for Jesus to come, call us up out of this world, amen, not to help us fit in, not to help us be better down here, amen, not to, to cause the world to understand us, not to cause the world to appreciate us. That's not our objective. That's not our objective by a mile. Our objective here is to be different, to show them we are different, and to testify of our daysman, the day spring, the day star that we're looking for. And listen, there's going to be the dawning of a new day, and that's the second coming of Christ. The Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in His wings. So as the day spring, He brings life and light through the incarnation. As the daysman, He makes reconciliation and peace by His death. As the day star, He brings His church home. Amen. And when the day dawns, then the Son of Righteousness is arising with healing in His wings there. And He's going to bring glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And folks, that message that we sing about and talk about at Christmas time is a second advent message. Right now this world, listen, the prince of the power of the air is the devil. The God of this world is the devil. You say, well, I don't want to hear all that kind of preaching. It, well, you don't have to listen. I've got to preach it. But it ain't going to change facts. People are wondering, what's wrong with the world? If God's real, what's wrong with the world? I'll tell you what's wrong with the world. God tells you in His Word what's wrong with the world. It's people. People are sinful. You and me included. If everything messed up in the world. Man messed it up. But listen to, to me. When He saved us, our association is with the day. And not of the night. It's not time. But our association isn't with the night time. Our association is with the day. We're children of the day. The day spring represents the atonement on the cross. By which we're justified. The day's moon represents the advocacy on the throne. By which we're secure. By which we're preserved. And the day star represents his advent. In which we're all going to be glorified. We're going to be like Jesus. Now let me ask you this tonight. Everything I just mentioned. How could anyone have a bad reaction to any of that? Amen. Think about it. What did Jesus do to anyone? What is the objection? What's the problem? 
You talk about people in his church, but they're just people. You talk about preachers in the pulpit, but they're just people too. Everything you point at and say, well, why did God do this? Why did God do this? If you examine the question you're asking, you'll find out somewhere at the root of that, there's a person. It ain't the Lord. It's the people. The solution to the world's problems and the solution to people's problems is the Lord. Listen, that we got a little bit of that when we got saved. And so we think about Jesus coming and the message of Jesus and the content of the message Good tidings of great joy and, and how He's the Savior and He's the Christ and He's the Son of David and He's the Lord and He brings salvation. We think about all this, we think, well, what is the objection? What's the problem? Jesus says, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. As the darkness of this world grows stronger, its hatred for the light grows more intense and it's more visible. And we say, well, we, we can fix that problem. We'll just shine the light. But this darkness ain't like darkness in a room. In a room when there's darkness, you just turn the light on. But we're talking about the darkness of someone's heart. And that darkness don't get in there until you have a willing heart. And so what happens when you turn the light on in that regard, what you either do is you find out whether that person's facing the light, desiring the light, and loves the light, or you find that that person's opposed the light, has rejected the lot and hates the lot. And that's what exactly what you realize by their reaction. That's what Jesus was talking about. So you know what, folks? As a preacher and as a child of God, as a member of Trinity Baptist Church and Trinity Baptist Church as a whole, you know what our duty is? It's to get a reaction out of people. And some, some folks don't want that. Some folks, they like the, the happy, just don't rock the boat kind of thing, but men need to know they're lost. They need to know why Jesus died on that cross. They need to understand they're lost. They're separated from God. They don't have a chance of going to heaven without Jesus Christ. They're going to hell. That's a reality. You and I need to be reminded that is a reality. And preach and you give more light from the Word of God. Not, it's not going to solve the problems of an unwilling heart. It's going to manifest the darkness. Jesus said, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. Over there in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 2, the Bible tells us about Herod's response to the birth of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, quote, he was troubled. The Bible says, quote, he was exceeding wroth. The Bible says, quote, he would seek to kill the child. That was Herod's response. That's the response of a ruler. That's how the government feels about him. <laughs> amen. All human government. Uh, amen. All human governments represented as a beast. Do you understand that? You say, well, that's just men. Yeah, I know it's just men. But boy, when men get together, they sure can make a mess of things. And it's one, his, his reaction is one of anger and disdain. It is a wrathful attitude. In that same chapter, Matthew chapter 2, he talks about how Herod then would gather to him all of the chief priests and all the scribes. I mean, these are religious leaders of Israel. Herod brings them in before them and demands of them where Christ should be born. Now they're on the spot. What do they do? Well, they knew the answer. They went right to the Scripture there. And they said, uh, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now, isn't that wild? He pulls those men in there before him, those religious leaders, and he says, Where is Christ going to be born? And they told him where. And later on, by Daniel's prophecy, those folks come within two years. Of when he's going to be born. Right? Everybody, uh, everybody familiar with that truth? They come within two years of when he's going to be born. But what was the religious response? Nothing. They had book, chapter, and verse. They had answers. They just didn't do anything about it. You know what? That, that's the religious response. It's one of apathy and disinterest. Whatever will be, will be. The ruler responded with anger and disdain, a wrathful attitude. The religious response was apathy and disinterest. And I'd say that's a warped attitude. That's weird, amen? How can you know what you know when it doesn't have any effect on you? That's, that's what I wonder about those men. But then the Bible talks about the wise men, and with them there's a right response. Amen? There's one of adoration. There's one there of worship. It's a worshipful attitude. It is one of devotion. And here's the issue tonight. 
What's our attitude? <laughs> what is our reaction to light? Are we trying to hide? Are we trying to fit in? Are we just trying to get along, be festive, seasonal this time of year, just get caught up with what everybody else is caught up with? It's just all about man and peace on earth. Friends, there ain't no peace on this earth right now. And there's not going to be any peace on this earth till Jesus, the dawn, amen, awakes and, and He comes back, the Son of Righteousness, arising with healing in His wings. And all the talk about peace right now is just that. It's just talk. And men use those words to cover up intentions of control and power and usually leads to a war. And again, I'm not trying to be so negative. I'm going to be honest with you. That's what, that's what happens in this world. The Bible says, If our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Ephesians chapter 5 says this, church, says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And listen to what he said. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That's, that's the responsibility of light. It isn't to mix in with the darkness of the world. It's to reprove it. Amen. To bring people to a reaction. You know what some of your folks need to realize? They're on the wrong side of God. Some of the folks you work with, they need to realize they're on the wrong side of God. And I'm not advocating you being hateful. Amen. You know that. I, I'm not advocating that. I'm not advocating you being a smart aleck. Amen. I'm not advocating that. I am advocating us being honest. He said, walk as children of light. The difference between us and the lost is simply the Spirit of God. That's it. He's in you and me that are saved. He's not in the lost. And for all the problems they can point out with us, it's just people problems. The real problem is their reaction to the light. Their reaction to the truth. Light does not have fellowship with darkness. We need to be reminded about that as Christians we're children of light. We're children of the day. We're not to have fellowship with darkness. We can't walk with God and walk in darkness. And God in His nature is light. In Him is no darkness at all. That's speaking to the self-inherent righteousness of the Lord. He is righteous. Something interesting here. Uh, over there in Genesis at the opening of the Bible, it says God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. That it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And I noticed there that that's a created light. And I noticed there that it's not the sun. Because sun doesn't show up till the fourth day. Now what that light I believe is a physical manifestation of the presence of God. Who is a spirit. And this light dwells with God. And God dwells in the light. This is why over there in Job 38, when the Lord shows up with a list of questions to Job, He says to him, Hast thou perceived the breath of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Then He asks, Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? That thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof. Now the answer to that question, Where is the way that light dwelleth? is given in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 22, he says, He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness. And the light dwelleth with him. Where is the way the light dwelleth? Daniel said it dwells with him. Now Paul, by the Spirit of God, said in 1 Timothy 6.15, he says, Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, this is just knowing God. We're going to know God. We're going to walk with God. We're going to have to realize, as Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If someone's going to successfully navigate their way through this world, they're going to have to follow Christ. Because he's the light of the world. And if they follow him, they're not going to walk in darkness. But as they follow Christ, they're going to have the light of life. 
The problem down south is you got a lot of folks that are just stuck in darkness. But they still talk about the good Lord. They talk about loving the Lord and how the Lord loves them. You talk to them about issues of darkness in their life and you try to help them. And you're not trying to hurt anybody. You're just trying to help them. And they begin to talk about, you know, well, I pray. Don't you realize that your prayer is an abomination if it's coming from a heart that rejects the light? You understand? The Lord's not looking at what you're doing. He's looking at your heart. And if someone is repulsed by the light, they can't walk with God. And the Lord's looking at the heart. He's the light of the world. And what that speaks to is His prominence. And it speaks to His preeminence. Prominent means that he's, he, stands, he stands out. He stands alone. Preeminent means he's, he's above everything. He not only has distinguished Himself, He is above it all. He is alone. He's the light of the world. Amen. Over in John chapter 9, you got a man that gets healed of his blindness just to give you a visible illustration of someone getting saved. Amen. Because that's what the Lord did for us when we got saved. That spiritual blindness left. The Bible again says, If our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded their minds from the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. They're blinded. And what Jesus does in John chapter 9 is He heals a man of his blindness there. And of course you... You look at that, what takes place as this man begins to experience sight and begins to glory in the Lord. There's all kinds of others that are around him that aren't exi exactly excited about what's happened. There's all sorts of ugliness taking place. They're threatening to throw people out of the temple. They're talking about how Jesus is a sinner and they know it. You say, what happened? Well, the light walked in. <laughs> and one man was able to see because of it. A lot of others, it manifested what was in them. It manifested the darkness. And listen, being the light of the world speaks of His prominence. It speaks of His preeminence there. He's excellent. Amen. He's above it all. And it speaks to the dark nature of the world. We talk about this world being a dark place. It's dark times and it's getting darker. And by darkness, I'm referring to depravity. And I don't mean to sound like a Calvinist, amen, or anything, but this world is depraved. What I mean by that is, I mean it's it's against God. You do realize that, brother? You realize that, sister? You say, well, I, I don't want to hear that, preacher. Well, it's not going to change anything. It was true in Jesus' day, and it's true in this day. This world is against God. And man in his spirit is anti-Christ. He is pro-man. That's, that's, that's seen in all the entertainment. That's seen in all the music. That's seen in all the athletics. It's all about man and the glory of man. And we got to watch getting caught up in it. Amen. The world's depraved. Depraved in its entertainment. It's even depraved in its education. I know I'm preaching to teachers tonight. Amen. I know that. But I know that that means you've been to college. You've sat under some infidels. You've listened to people who the world said had answers that didn't even know what the questions were. You've heard more than I've heard. I'm not saying this against anybody in that profession. Thank God for every Christian teacher out there. Because the education system sure is a mess. It's depraved what they want people to learn. You know what they want? They want to educate our children out of the fear of God. They want to educate them out of any thought of God at all. That's the spirit of the day. And it's depraved. It's deceived. Deceived. Amen. Deceived because it has an unbelieving heart. And Satan has blinded the minds of them which believe not. And that's the situation. They're, they're easily deceived, depraved, desperate. When I say desperate, I'm, I say she's uh, represented by that strange woman over there in the book of Proverbs. And you just read that passage and you realize what's going on there. You see someone who's always looking for new buyers. You ever notice that about the world? It's always selling something. It's always selling something. You get men, they in their depravity, they get away from their families, they get away from their wives, and they start trying to get restless and get into all types of depravity and wickedness. And that's what you see in the book of Proverbs. You, you see someone there that's walking around a street corner where there's a woman that's advertising. And without getting into the doctrinal aspect of that tonight, that's a whole other message. And without talking about sexual immorality, which basically is the passage. The spiritual application is this world. It's always trying to seduce us. 
It's always trying to lure people away. When people get away from God, they become restless. They start looking for answers. They start seeking something, some sort of fulfillment. And they get lied to by the world that the world has the answers. And the world does not have the answers. Just like that young man goes after that woman and it's a trap. And her steps lead way to hell. That's what this world does to young men every day. Chews them up and spits them out. And they come out thinking like the world. And one day after all their life is spent, the world's going to play some sad movie. And write some sad song and show them what a vain life they've lived. You know what they're going to do to try to kill the memories? They're going to drink and they're going to dope or worse. That's what this world do to them. It uses them up and kicks them to the curb. And it happens all the time, friend. You know who the light of the world is? It's Jesus Christ. There is no hope in this world except for the one who came into this world. Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, the hope of this world is Christ and His redemption. I mean, right now, this world's on a crash collision course. It's been going that way for 6,000 years. It's headed for trouble. It's headed for a crash. You don't even know what kind of crash it's headed for. They're worried about the economic crash. And I don't know if that's coming or not. I really don't know. But I'll tell you what, we've got far bigger problems than the rich getting richer and the poverty of the poor and the middle class shrinking. Amen. you got a lot more problems than global warming that everybody's worried about. Listen, this world's got a lot more problems than half of them thinking it's capitalism, the other half of them thinking it's communism. The problem is called judgment. The Bible says every mouth has been stopped. All the world has become guilty before God. But Christ, He's a lot of the world. You know, right now, there's going to be a a superficial fixing for a lot of people's loneliness. They're going to get with family and they're going to be comforted for a little while. And then afterwards, that big hole is going to return. For a lot of others, this, this time of the year is going to remind them of the hole that's already there. And they're going to suffer with a bout of loneliness like no one's business. Everyone else getting together and singing and talking about good times and they're going to be sitting alone. A lot of them have suffered great loss because of sin. Some of them suffered great loss because of someone else's sin. And it's that time of the year when everybody just, hey, it seems like all's right with the world. What I wanted to preach to you tonight is simply remind you, it's never all right with the world. This world's a mess. Men are a mess. And for all the music and all the entertainment and all the temporary relief, the only thing's going to fix the problem. It's for them to know Jesus Christ. And the only thing that's going to fix the problems of this world is for Him to come back. Because it's just swirling down there. The light of the world speaks to our responsibility, friends, in closing. What is our responsibility? Reflect the light. Reflect the light and represent the light. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, This then is the message which we've heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. That's a sweet arrangement. Even if we are down here. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) To live down here with a good conscience. You can't buy that. That's not for sale. You either experience that through the benefits of being close with the Lord or you don't have it. And listen, I say this tonight. Keep short accounts with the Lord. If you mess up, get it fixed. Get that thing under the blood and return back to form and get walking with the Lord because that's the only way this is going to make sense down here. Everything's backwards. Everything's upside down. Everything's going the wrong direction. And we get messed up trying to fit in. We don't fit in for a reason. We're different. And the Lord wants us to be different. This world needs to come to a reaction to light. That's what Jesus did. Some people, when he preached, they said, Never man spake like this man. Others said, Who knoweth what this babbler saith? Same preacher, same message. One walks away with one idea, and the other one walks away with another idea. He said, What's the difference? The heart. Which way is it facing? 
Which way is it facing? I want to ask you to stand tonight. Stand with your heads bowed. and we'll Go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, if you know the Lord and you need to get close to Him tonight, then we're going to have a time of invitation where you can do just that. Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. It's just between you and Him. It doesn't have to be public unless the Lord moved upon you to do that. And like I said, at any moment, you could let me know. Other than that, every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. We're just coming to God to get clean. If you're here tonight and your feet are weak, and you just need some strength in, uh, in your devotion and your determination, some decisions, then come and get it. Come and set some new commitments. Some new level of devotion. It's between you and the Lord. It's between you and Him anyway. But tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ, listen, I would love to meet you right down here at the front. If you got any questions about being saved, we got a Bible right here and it has all the answers. The Bible will give you book, chapter, and verse how to be saved. There's no reason you sitting there not knowing what to do. The gospel is plain. It's simple. When Jesus came, it was good tidings of great joy to all people. You included. He came for you. He wants to save you. If you've never been saved, we'll help you. We can't save you. We can't even be a part of that, but we can show you the Savior. Father, I pray that you'll bless the word as it's been preached tonight. Bear witness to the truth. Help us all, Lord God, Lord, to make decisions, make commitments, Lord, according to what you said. And if there's someone here that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, we pray for their soul tonight. We pray against the works of Satan that has blinded them. Ask you, Lord God, to help them see the truth in Jesus' name. And you begins to play. Everyone praying.